Mike, thank you so much. It's a great to be at RTS Charlotte. I think I've been to every RTS in the world except this one. And now I can die and go to heaven. I've been to <laughs> RTS Charlotte. It's great to see Dr. Layton Ford here, a friend of mine for many years, a great soldier of the cross, all of you who've come today. And I feel pretty comfortable talking about Calvin at RTS. I'm not sure I should. I should be intimidated maybe, but uh, we'll give it a go. Uh, this lecture is a little bit widely cast. It's going to be a more general kind of lecture. The one this afternoon is much more focused on a particular document, Calvin's first theological book, uh, which was published uh, in 1542 but written probably in 1536. But I want to begin by a reflection on the word ministry. It was in 1956. That was almost smack dab in the middle of the 20th century that a new book came out, got a lot of attention. It was titled, The Purpose of the Church and Its Ministry. It was written by a well-known theologian, H. Richard Niebuhr. And it gave a kind of overview of ministry and church life and projections for what was to come. And there's one line in that book that, that caught my attention when I first read it. Niebuhr says, the ministry has become a perplexed profession. What did he mean by that? A perplexed profession. Well, neither ministers nor the schools that nurture them, like I'm sure RTS, are guided today by a clear, generally accepted conception of the office of the ministry. And there are many reasons for that. We don't have time to go into that. But I think it's the fact that many things that used to be done by ministers are no longer necessary, it seems, are no longer appreciated for sure. So what does it mean that we are called to minister in a world like this? Uh, education. Many of the things that used to be done by ministers, by the clergy, that sounds so old-fashioned, doesn't as a term anymore, uh, now are done in secular institutions or maybe state institutions entirely. The charity function of the clergy has been taken over by local agencies. The pastoral care functions largely assumed by psychologists, psychiatrists, or other health professionals. The prophetic function of the clergy taken over by social reformers of various sorts. I suppose the the last person to address the culture on the basis of a transcendent claim to truth in this vein was Martin Luther King, Jr. The preaching function, too, that most of us think ought to be at the very heart of what ministry is about, uh, has been displaced for many people by gurus of all kinds of spiritualities, uh, whether from the raucous right or the loony left or the mushy middle, hardly matters. One of my mentors in Calvin studies, a uh, person from this area of the, the country, was John Leith. He was a Presbyterian theologian who belonged, I believe, to the ARP. You've heard of those people? <laughs> well, uh, John Leith published a book uh, called The Reformed Imperative. And then the subtitle was just extraordinary. I've, I don't think I've ever read a book with a better subtitle. The Reformed Imperative what the church has to say that no one else can say. Think about that. Does the church have anything to say that nobody else can say, that nobody else is saying in the way that we are called to say it? Well, I want to ask the question what we can learn about such matters from John Calvin, from his life and his theology. Now, I have to make a confession. I am not a Calvinist with a capital C. I am a Reformed Baptist, and I stand in the tradition of two London confessions of faith in the 17th century and of great Baptist Calvinists such as John Bunyan, Benjamin Keach, Andrew Fuller, and Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I'm very happy to claim that heritage as my own because those great servants of Christ have shaped my life and thinking in many ways. Does John Calvin have anything to say that we really think is worth listening to about ministry? Let me tell you a story. 
It's a story about one of my teachers. His name was Harvey Cox. He's still living today. He's retired from Harvard. And uh, Harvey Cox told the story of when he himself was a student minister. Uh, it was in the early, early 60s. Now, Harvey Cox became famous in 1963 when he published a book called The Secular City. It was a bestseller. Not many books on theology or church or ministry are bestsellers. His was. But this is a story that comes earlier in his life. He was just out of his school, early school period in the 60s. And he had signed up as an ecumenical student worker for some agency just at the time that the Berlin Wall was going up. It was a very tense time between East and West. In fact, a number of people lost their lives. If you've ever been to Berlin, they have there what's called Checkpoint Charlie. It's a museum that tells the story of the people who were trying to escape from East Germany and got caught in the crossfire. Many of them lost their lives. But Harvey Cox was an American. He had an American passport, which meant he was able to travel with some freedom back and forth between East and West. And he became a courier for pastors and Christian lay people on both sides of that theological and political ideological divide. He says he was sometimes able to smuggle theological books into the East on these kind of clandestine trips that he would make into what was then communist Germany. And he makes this statement, what people wanted most were copies of Karl Barth's church dogmatics, which is, you know, a pretty large task to carry around. Uh, Bart called them white elephants because in their German publication, they had a white covering on the back. Pretty heavy and hard to smuggle. But he would carry with him in various wrappings and disguises Bart's dogmatics. And he makes this comment. To carry something in by Bultmann would have been a wasted risk. Let the bourgeois preachers in West Germany agonize about the three-decker universe and existentialism. We had weightier matters to confront. And what that little story represents to me is this question. What kind of theology is worth smuggling? Do we have a theology? Do we have a view of ministry rooted in theology that we are willing to risk something for? A theology worth smuggling? Well, I think John Calvin can help us answer that question. I hope so. I'm going to try to present you four points of Calvin's theology of ministry and theology itself that I think will inform us. Now, here you have a five-point Calvinist giving you a four-point Calvin, but it'll work. You just trust me. I don't need to tell you because you doubtless know that Calvin is one of both the most highly esteemed and the most meanly despised persons in the history of Christianity. Uh, He's been called the founder of a new civilization. That's a phrase that comes from the historian Emil Leonard. Uh, Calvin is complicated. Some have gone so far to say he's the greatest thinker since the Apostle Paul and a near infallible guide to every human endeavor from art and architecture to politics and economics. But on the other side of the ledger, his detractors have been numerous and vocal. Many of them think of him as the cruel tyrant of Geneva, morose, a bitterly, utterly inhuman figure. This didn't start in recent times. In the 16th century, Calvin was a polarizing figure, too. If you're looking for an ironic reformer that wants to get along with everybody, that's just a great, jovial person, then I would say maybe give Bootser a try. Uh, or, or think about Erasmus sometimes, but not John Calvin. Uh, some people in Geneva who didn't like Calvin or his Reformation decided they would take out the two letters of his name, and so instead of Calvin, he became Cain. Uh, It was an insult, and he took it that way. Uh, Well, a few few months ago, I had the privilege of uh, meeting and speaking with, at a conference, uh, the writer, well-known Pulitzer Prize-winning author, Marilyn Robinson. And uh, Marilyn Robinson has developed a kind of fondness for Calvin. Strangely, she belongs to the UCC, which is not a fundamentalist denomination. 
Uh, but nonetheless, uh, she appreciates Calvin as a, as a thinker, as a writer, as a scholar, and even as a theologian to some extent, and she's kind of put off by the fact that nobody else seems to be interested in him very much in her circles. One does not even think about reading Calvin. He seems to be neglected on principle. Why does Calvin still generate such contrary emotions? What has kept Calvin from fading into the shadows of church history as so many other people from the past have done? Well, uh, I have uh, four points about ministry and Calvin I want to share with you. The first one is simply a well-known fact, often recited in the literature, but it's true and worth thinking about. Calvin was a second-generation reformer. The Reformation was already up and running before he joined it. He was barely eight years old when Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the castle church door at Wittenberg. He was born in the cathedral city of Noyon. That's about 55 miles just northeast of Paris. His father was something of an administrative assistant to the bishop. And his father pulled strings in order to acquire for him a benefice. Now, benefice was a kind of scholarship. It was actually a chunk of money attached to a particular office. And it allowed the person to use the benefits of the benefice without doing the work of the benefice. And that's exactly what Calvin did. He was barely 12 years old. So what could he have done even in the 16th century in ministry? But he had a benefice. And this enabled him to hire some flunky priest to go and do, say the mass, do his job. And he took the lion's share of the money and went off to the University of Paris, where he became a student studying at the Collège de Montaigu, the same school that Erasmus had studied at earlier and that Ignatius Loyola would study at just after Calvin. In fact, as Calvin was leaving, Loyola was coming. And I like to think it may be a fantasy uh, that for a day or two or maybe a month or two, the paths of these two great protagonists of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation cross paths at the Collège de Montague and use the same books in the same library and ate the same bad food in the same cafeteria. <laughs> I can't prove that beyond a shadow of doubt. So when Calvin joined the Protestant cause in the 1530s, and again, we're not very sure when and exactly how that happened. A lot's been written about that. He doesn't tell us very much himself. But it seemed that the Reformation at that point in the 1530s was beginning to fall apart. 1525, Luther and Erasmus have their famous quarrel over the bondage of the will. They never write or speak to one another after that encounter. Driving a wedge, not just between those two figures, but between the two movements they represented. Humanism on the one hand, Reformation on the other. Luther and Zwingli had quarreled bitterly over the Lord's Supper at the Colloquy of Marburg in 1529. Two years later, Zwingli was dead, having been killed on the battlefield of Kappel. And when Luther heard about it, he said, it's a well-merited end for such a heretic. And then, of course, there was the Peasants' War of 1525, in which more than 100,000 people were killed. The closest thing you have in the 16th century to what we would call a modern revolution would be the Peasants' Revolt of 1525. And then there was the city of Munster, which discredited Anabaptism as a force of constructive reform, polygamy, violence. When you said Anabaptist in the 1530s, you didn't think of pacifists like Michael Sattler, Swiss Brethren not bearing the sword, not taking the oath. You thought about Munster, the horrible debacle of that city, people being slaughtered and killed in the streets. Later, in one of the few ecumenical adventures of the 16th century, Catholics and Protestants joined forces together to conquer the city of Munster and put down the Anabaptist movement. All this was happening when John Calvin became identified with the Reformed movement. It wasn't called the Reform Movement, really, at that point. That came a little later. Uh, they were called evangelicals, basically. Sometimes Lutherans, to give credit to Luther. But it's at this precise moment. Zwingli is dead. Erasmus is dying. He will die in Basel in 1536, the same year in which Calvin published in that city 
the first edition of his Institutes of the Christian Religion. Erasmus dying, Luther quiescent, if not quiet, and the Roman Catholic Church resurgent, Council of Trent about to convene, the Radical Reformation fragmented and discredited. At this particular moment, when things seem to be falling apart all over the place, John Calvin emerges as the leader of a new movement and the reformulator of a new theology. Let me take that back. Not really a new theology. It was the theology of Martin Luther repackaged in a new way and given new life in a different setting. Luther's Reformation was largely based in landed Germany, Scandinavia later, whereas Calvin's Reformation was an urban city event. So here we find Calvin as, in the middle of all of this, a theologian of the frontier. Now that's a term that's been used a lot, but I think I first read it in a French scholar, read a very good biography of Calvin. It's been translated into English. His name is Bernard Cotre. And he's a wonderful biography. And he points out that Calvin spent his whole life on the frontier, literally as well as figuratively. The major cities where Calvin lived, all of them in his life, were on the frontier. Uh, the ministry where he spent his time as a teacher of the church or a pastor were all frontier cities. Basel, for example, on the Rhine River. Strasbourg, a little further north, also on the Rhine River. Uh, Geneva itself. Now we think of Geneva today. Some of you no doubt have been there. Beautiful city on Lake Le Mans. And we think of it, of course, as a part of Switzerland which politically it is and has been since the time of Napoleon. But in the 16th century, it was not Swiss. And it was surely a way to be insulted if you called a Genevan person a Swiss. They never gave up their fierce Genevan independence. And to some extent, they still have that today. When you visit Geneva today, you'll see the building that houses the Genevan church, the Swiss Reformed Church of Geneva. It's called Eglise Nationale de Genève. Did you get that? The National Church of Geneva. Well, it's just a canton, but they have a sense of themselves as a nation, very proud of their Genevan independence. And that became a problem for Calvin when he moved there because he was not a Genevan. He was French, French-speaking, French by culture, and that was a problem for the people in Geneva. It was a border town. It was a frontier city squeezed in between the great country of France on the one hand and the Swiss cantons on the other, in particular Bern, which is not geographically very far from Geneva, but had great conflict with Geneva in the 16th century. And just a little south of Geneva, the Duchy of Savoy toward Italy, squeezed in between these different polities at the intersection of three different states. What does it mean to say that Calvin was a frontier theologian? Another one of Calvin's biography, biographers, William Bousma, has found in this fact Calvin's sense of displacement and homelessness. He never really had a home. Uh, remember back to Erasmus who wandered from place to place. He was born in Rotterdam, we think but not, wasn't really Dutch in any meaningful sense of the word, wandered around from place to place. To some extent, that's true of Calvin as well. Even though he lived in a city, Geneva, for a number of years, and Strasbourg for a shorter number of years, he never really was fully accepted either place. He only became a citizen of Geneva four years before his death. Bausma says all this goes back to his early childhood, to the fact that he was never really very close to his father. Unlike Luther, Luther had problems with his father, of course. We remember that. But in a sense, he reconciled with his father and brought both his father and his mother to Wittenberg to live out their final years. Not so, Calvin. There was a frostiness with his father until his death in 1535. And also the fact that his mother, the beautiful Jeanne Lafranc, 
died when he was only four or five years old. So he grows up really without a mother, with a distant father. He grows up cared for by other people, some of whom were very kind to him, to be sure. Showered him with many wonderful gifts, but he never had a sense of belonging, this sense of displacement. I think you need to take that in to understand what Calvin is about, this sense of homelessness, this longing for a country to which he belonged, but to which he could never return, France. There's no doubt that Calvin's gospel was a haven for the dispossessed, for those who felt themselves without a home, who felt themselves, in fact, refugees. And this is another major motif in Calvin. This is all a part of my first point about him being a theologian of the frontier. And that is, his reformation was a reformation for refugees. He himself was a refugee, fleeing France, fleeing persecution, when he came to Geneva in the first place in 1536. One of my great teachers was Heiko Obermann, to whom we're all indebted for so much who study the Reformation. He talks about the Reformation essentially being divided into two different types of people. He calls them trekkers and settlers. The trekkers are those who are scattered, who are on the move, who are... uh, Peripatetic, they're traveling, they're displaced, they're often refugees. The settlers, on the other hand, were the homesteaders, those who settled in polities, particularly in territories like Germany and Scandinavia, where Lutheranism is so very strong. But in the Reformation, the followers of John Calvin were the great trekkers of the 16th century, the trekkers of the Protestant message throughout all of Europe and really internationally. They trekked to Holland, from Holland to Hungary, from Hungary to Poland, from the churches of London to the reformers of Polish Lithuania, John Knox in Scotland. They went everywhere. They were always on the move. And in 1555, from Geneva, under Calvin's guidance, there set out a mission for not France, they had many missions to France, of course, during this period of time, but all the way to Brazil, led by Admiral Gaspar de Coligny. They wanted to get the gospel as far as they could to the ends of the earth. They were trekkers, and they were insistent upon doing it. That's at the heartbeat of real Calvinism in the 16th century. Now, Calvinism has been compared, maybe with some justification, we could argue this, to Bolshevism in the early 20th century. Bolshevism became a kind of international coterie of folks who were always on the move. They were not settlers by and large. They were trekkers. And that was true of Calvin's followers as well. Trekkers. They were trekkers moving out from their city of Geneva, Zurich, and Strasbourg, and London, and Emden, unto the four corners of the world. And so Calvin, there's some justification in Emil Leonard's designation of Calvin as the founder of a new civilization. He wanted to take the old golden standard and burnish it off and give it a new life. That's the tradition of Catholic small c Christianity, to which John Calvin felt deeply committed and believed that he was called to lead the church back to that important place. Now, if you want to compare Calvin to, say, the Middle Ages, the period before him in history, you need to think about the mendicant friars, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, who broke with the tradition of Benedictine monasticism. If you visit a Benedictine monastery today, and I love to go to Benedictine monasteries as opposed to well, I shouldn't say the other orders, but, you know, the other ones. Uh, it's because they're so hospitable. They give you better gravy on your potatoes. It's just a, a very nice, hospitable environment, Benedictine mon- uh, monasticism. But the thing about Benedictine monasticism, it's meant for you to go and stay there. If you're a monk, to stay there until you die. And after you die, to be buried there. One of the places I always first visit when I go to a monastery is the cemetery where the monks are buried in the order in which they die. 
That's where you live. That's where you serve. That's where you pray. That's where you die. That's where you're buried. That's where you're remembered. You have a place. And their word, their motto was stabilitas, stabilitas loci, stability of place. Well, the great motif of the Calvinist and the mendicants, by the way, was not stabilitas, but mobilitas, movement, mobility. Calvin, as a theologian of the frontier, I think ought to help us see him in his historical significance. The Calvinists of the 16th, 17th century were the successors to the mendicant friars, to the Franciscans and the Dominicans, who in the 13th century were on the move, mobilitas, Where do they go? Into the universities. This is when universities are being founded, actually. And it's the mendicant friars who enter into the universities. Some of them rise to positions of great authority and and esteem, like St. Thomas Aquinas. He was a Dominican. Or Bonaventura. He was a Franciscan. They go into the universities, but not only there, they go into the cities. Cities are new, too. After the Crusades, cities begin to emerge in the context of that uh, event and into the cities with all of the social immobility and, and disaster that often happens then and now in cities. These mendicant friars went with the message of Jesus Christ. Not stabilitas, but mobilitas. Calvin belongs to that same tradition. Into the cities, into the market squares of Europe, So not too much ought to be made of the fact that Calvinism is the father or mother of capitalism, Max Weber's thesis. But there's something there. There's something in that thesis that's worth thinking about a little deeper than has been done. They were on the move. You've got to think of these early Calvinists not settled down around a a snug uh, fireplace, drinking their ale. No, they were on the move. They were... They were educators and entrepreneurs and, I'm going to use a word now, colporters. Who is a colporter? Well, the whole early Calvinist Reformation was sponsored and supported by the colporters. They were people who carried books with them, often disguised, just like Harvey Cox disguising Bart's dogmatics to carry them into a dangerous place. These people were colporters. They were carrying forbidden literature into places where it was dangerous to go, into the four corners of Europe and the world even beyond. Calvin's concept of himself and of his role as a reformer and his understanding of the ministry of the church is very much related to how Paul Tillich, who's not my favorite theologian, but occasionally it's good to take some quinine, uh, Paul Tillich described his own situation in a little book he wrote around 1928, still in Germany, called On the Boundary, On the Boundary. Not only was Calvin on the boundary, the geographical boundary of the papacy and the empire, the boundary between France and Germany and Switzerland, that's where Geneva is, all that, but also the boundary between humanism and reformation. Calvin was both. The boundary between revolution and restoration. The boundary between quiescence in the face of evil, that's the Anabaptist alternative, or resistance to the powers that be. That becomes the Calvinist alternative in many ways. The boundary between the medieval and the modern. The boundary between Zwinglian spiritualism and Lutheran localism. Now, I've gotten this far in in my lecture, and I haven't even mentioned the word postmodern. Not one single time, because it's so old and antiquated anymore. We're we're in an ultra-post-postmodern world, and we don't know how to define it, even so. We just know, as Dorothy said to Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. (laughs) It's different than it was. Calvin lived in this kind of world, and he was what I have called a horizontal figure. Now, editors don't like that word. I've used it in a number of articles and books. Always comes back crossed out. 
and the editor writes in horizontal instead. There, there's a difference between horizon and horizontal. If you're horizontal, you're dead. A horizon, you're looking to the future. That's Calvin. Not, he wasn't horizontal till 1564. He, he, he was horizontal. He was moving toward the horizon. And that's an important thing for us to think about when we think about our own place. Now, the second point I want to mention, and I have to do this quickly, I know, is that Calvin understood ministry as a calling rather than a profession. Of course, he had a profession. He was a lawyer. We know that Luther, in defiance of his father, gave up the study of law to become a theologian. Whereas Calvin, in obedience to his father, gave up the study of theology to become a lawyer. And a pretty good one by all accounts. He was not only a reformer of the second generation, but he also was a reformer of the second occupation. And here we have to talk about his famous calling in Geneva when he's confronted by Guillaume Farrell. He doesn't want to stay. He wants to be on his way, always moving. But he's compelled, as it were, by a divine summons. If you do not stay with us and carry on the work of reform here, God will condemn you, Pharrell said to him. And so he was called into a different kind of line of work that he had not contemplated in that same kind of way at all. He wanted a carol in the library to do his scholarship and let the rest of the world go by. But God, as he says, napped him by the neck. And thrust him into the game. That's Calvin's language. Thrust me into the game. Now we have Calvin's famous statement where he talks about his sudden conversion. Subita conversio. We ought to be careful that that word subita is not understood in simply a temporal way. It's not that God simply zapped him one day out of the blue with no warning. It's rather, it has to do with, Calvin uses these Latin words, my calling was Praetor spame, that means beyond all hope, beyond all expectation, something that came from outside of myself, from a divine sermons. That was what sudden conversion meant to him. Not something he, you could prepare for by taking the Myers-Briggs test. Uh, it's something that was deeply uh, outside of himself. And he relates it in his commentary on Galatians. That's the best place to read about this, I think. Not the institutes and not his letters, satellite, all that's good. But go back to his Galatians commentary in the first chapter. And he talks about his calling in three different steps. Number one, the eternal predestination of God. Two, God's separation from the womb. He's quoting Jeremiah, right? Which God has taken our lives and choreographed them in a certain way. And three, this calling which comes from beyond ourselves is the effect of both of these, God's predestining call and the fact that we have been, our steps have been ordered, as the Bible says. The steps of a godly man are ordered by the world. And the word we talk about, predestination, I, I can't give a lecture at RTS without mentioning predestination. I shouldn't. Uh, Huckleberry Finn uh, created by Mark Twain, talks about listening to a perplexing Calvinist sermon one time on what, what he called pre-for-or-destination. <laughs> pre-for-or-destination. Uh, I think the most important thing to say, and all I want to say really about Calvin's doctrine of predestination is how utterly normal it was, how not unusual it was in the context of the Christian tradition. He was in large, if not precise, agreement in every way with figures like St. Augustine, of course, whom he quotes more than anybody else in the Institutes except the Bible, and Thomas Aquinas as well, who was on this point a radical Augustinian. He was, of course, tracking Luther as well, who struggled with this issue in his great debate with Erasmus. Election he uses this word, which was a tag in scholasticism, anti previsa merita. That means before, beyond, before all pre-seen merits, all foreknown merits, not based 
on anything we have done or that even God can foresee that we might do, but surely and solely out of the grace of God. This is the fundamental aspect of Calvin's doctrine of predestination, together with the fact that it has a precisely Christological focus. And so when you're going through the book of Romans, you don't start in chapter 9. I mean, some people do. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, and what shall the vessel say to the one who made it? Why did you make me thus? You don't start there. You get there, and you don't skip over it when you do, but you don't start there. You start where Paul started, Romans 1. Creation, what we would call general revelation. You start with God's implanting his image in the human conscience. You go on to talk as Paul does in chapter 2 and 3 about sin and the grace of God that is poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And you go on to chapter 7 and 8, which ends in that tremendous crescendo, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And only when you've gone all the way through those deep waters of Romans 1 to 8 are you ready to venture forward into the even deeper waters of 9 to 11. They're there. Don't skip them, but don't start there. Calvin didn't start there, neither did Luther. They start with Jesus Christ and him crucified. They start with the unfolding of the love of God in the giving of his son. And you see this also in Calvin's commentary on Romans as well as in book three of the Institutes. It comes down to this one statement. For John Calvin, the elect are not the elite we have no reason to think that God should have chosen us rather than somebody else. It's the famous question of Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. It was Augustine's favorite verse. Who made you different from anybody else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast and glory and brag about it as though you did not? Well, Calvin had to struggle to this conclusion. He didn't start there. He struggled to it. He walks onto the stage of history as a person under compulsion, reluctant to take center stage. And many times he will speak about Geneva as an abyss. That's one of his favorite words. An abyss into which he had fallen. I'd rather take up 10,000 crosses, he said, than go back there after he'd been expelled from, from his first visit. And you'll never understand Calvin or his view of ministry without fully hearing this note, the reticence, the hesitancy, the shyness, the bashfulness, you call it whatever you want to, this shrinking back, not wanting to be center stage, but compelled to do the duty he believed God had given him, not his profession, but his calling. It was not a calling without a sense of self-doubt. I say that even though the evidence is rather slender because Calvin is so reticent to talk about himself. We don't find in Calvin anywhere of that robust hand-to-hand -hand combat with the devil, for example, that you do in Luther, his Anfechtungen. But sometimes read the correspondence of Calvin from 1538, after he had been expelled from Geneva, before he had been received in his temporary home of Strasbourg. He's on the road. He's a refugee again. And read the correspondence that comes from that year, 1538, with Louis de Chile. He'd been kicked out, he and Pharrell both, from Geneva. He's on the road. He's not yet in Strasbourg. And he gets a letter from Louis de Chile. Who was Louis de Chile? Well, he was Calvin's closest friend. You might say his school chum. They had known one another in France before Calvin ever came to Geneva. He and his family had welcomed Calvin into their home as a shelter, as a refugee when he was fleeing persecution in France. He and Louis de Tulle had read the scriptures together. They had prayed together. But now de Tulle is thinking, should I really have embraced the Reformation or not? This is early, 1538. There are a lot of people that said yes to the Reformation, but then had second thoughts and went a different way. Louis Duchelet was one of those. And he writes a letter to Calvin. And he begins to cast aspersions against Calvin's sense of calling. 
he begins to question Calvin's own commitment. And it stung him deeply that his best friends would cast this in his teeth in that moment of vulnerability. For Luther, the question was, are you alone wise? Who are you to go against 1,500 years of church tradition? For Calvin, the question was, was I really called? Was it God who led me to that abyss of Geneva or was it something else? And he doesn't talk about his calling in a robust way that does not also include some doubts. Later in the Institutes, this is a part of it that's often overlooked. Go back and read it, though. It's there. He's talking about faith. It's in that long chapter on faith. He will say, there's no such thing as genuine faith that is not tinged with doubt. That does not come from Kierkegaard. It does not come from Paul Tillich or some existentialist. It comes from John Calvin. Because he understood that a real faith is a faith that has been through the fires, tested, burnished in the oven of experience. It comes through on the other side with confidence in Jesus Christ. Well, I'm out of time and I have two big points to give. So uh, I, I think I'm going to just mention them and maybe five years from now you'll invite me back. You know. <laughs> Or I'll write it up somewhere and you can read it. But th these are big points. I, I don't want to leave them out completely, so I'll just mention them and then we'll, we'll bring this to a close. Point number three. The church as a community of grace sustained by word and sacrament. The Reformation was an ecclesial event. It wasn't just a matter of individual faith and belief in Jesus. Me and Jesus, we got a good thing going. Me and him, we got it all worked out. That's not Reformation theology. It's what Bonhoeffer called in that wonderful little book that we use as a textbook at Beeson, life together, life in community, life in covenant. Those are important words for John Calvin. And so the church is a community of grace, not a voluntary association. A God-wrought community of grace sustained by word and sacrament. I could say a lot more about that, but let me go and mention my last, my last point. And that is the fact that as Calvin stood at the frontier of all these different vortexes that were coming in upon him from all over the place, he develops an understanding of the Reformation in a long view. He was the reformer of the long view, by which I mean his key liturgical point that he makes, which again we ought to go back and reclaim with gusto. Sursum corda, lift up your hearts. Lift up your hearts to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts to the Lord. Why was Calvin so insistent on lifting up our hearts? He was not a Lutheran. He was not a ubiquitarian. He didn't believe that the body of Christ was brought down from heaven and parceled out on all the altars of Christendom. No. At the Holy Supper of the Lord, our hearts, by the power of the Spirit, are lifted up into the heavenlies, as Paul teaches in Ephesians 1. This is why Calvin spends so much of his time talking about meditation on the future life. That's a major theme in his spirituality and his understanding of the Christian faith. This meditation on the future life has an effect on a believer today. There is a kind of eschatological magnetism that pulls us forward despite everything that's happening all around us or even within us. It pulls us forward to the understanding that the risen and ascending Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit meets us in his embrace when we come to the supper of the Lord. And so he can't quite just go with what Zwingli wants to say all the way. Zwingli may have been given a bad rap by some people, but there's more of a sense of the reality of the presence of Christ in the supper of the Lord than simply remembering the good things that Jesus did for us on the cross. So these four points, um, I think, will help us understand ministry in Calvin a lot better.
His theology and his ministry were done in the long view. The sanctity of the secular was a way he tackled the world and his problems. And his ministry and theology then were not just tactical. What can we do to get a building program going? What, what can we do to reach the people in the next neighborhood? It was not just strategy and tactics. It was strategic looking forward to what God had done and will do in Jesus Christ. And so he says in 1541, the famous document, the Ordinance Ecclesiastique, when he goes back to Geneva from Strasbourg and sets up the rules of the church, here you have the fourfold office, pastor, teacher, elder, deacon, all of that. He also has a line in there. The need, he says, to raise up seed for the time to come so that we leave not the church a desert to our children. What a grand vision. A, a need to seed, raise up seed for the time to come, so that we leave not the church a desert to our children. Ministry with a long view answers those who ask, what will happen to the world with his kingdom is coming? To those who ask, what is before us? We answer, he the king stands before us. To those who ask, what may we expect? We answer, we are not standing before a pathless wilderness of unfulfilled time with a goal which no one would dare to predict. We are gazing rather upon our living Lord, our judge and savior who was dead and lives forevermore. We're gazing upon the one who has come and is coming and who will reign forever. It may be that we will counter, encounter affliction, but we know his work and his word, his royal word will not fail. Be comforted. I have overcome the world. This is ministry and theology with a long view, and is ministry and theology worth smuggling in a world like ours? Thank you. Well, this lecture is going to be a little different. I won't go uh, out of my whole time. In fact, what I kind of want to do is give you a synopsis of this lecture so you'll get some idea of what I'm talking about, maybe, and then just open it up for general discussion. It could be about this topic or this morning's topic or some other topic. Uh, I, I always like to do that, and I'm understanding that's acceptable here to do, so we'll go for a little while uh, on this question, and then we'll just call a halt to this and go to the general question format. So this lecture is about, it's called A Fresh Look at Calvin's First Book. It really wasn't his first book, was it? Because his first book was the commentary on Seneca. When Calvin was still a, a budding young humanist scholar, he took upon him the awesome task of uh, doing a critical edition of a very important and difficult classical treatise by the Roman philosopher Seneca on uh, clemency, de clemencia. Uh, and we have a modern critical edition of Calvin's work on editing uh, Seneca, uh, done by Ford Lewis Battles, a great Calvin scholar. And if you ever have a chance to go and check that out of the library, uh, you do so. It will all the more impress you with what a tremendous scholar of language, of textuality, that John Calvin, even the very young John Calvin was, to produce such a thing as that. But uh, the commentary on Seneca doesn't have very much, if any, theology in it. Uh, you know, historians search for, is there any wisp of a thing that he might have been influenced by Luther at that point? Well, not really. I mean, you can't make a good case out of that. It's a great piece of classical scholarship. Uh, it shows he knew how to read a text, he knew how to deal with language, but it doesn't really get to the heart of the Christian faith because I don't think he actually had been converted at that point. He was still trying to find his way through all of this, maybe reading some Luther, but uh, not quite taking it on board at that point. So his first real book as a Christian, I would say Protestant Christian, but the word Protestant's probably not quite right at that time, uh, is, is a little treatise called Sucopanachia. Calvin Sucopanachia. That's the name of it. Uh, maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you haven't. If you're a real Calvin scholar, you'll know about it because it's his first Protestant book. And that's really our interest in it. How does a young humanist scholar on the verge of 
being converted to become one of the great Protestant leaders of the Reformation, how does he deal with this question of uh, psychopanikia? What is psychopanikia? Well, it's a funny word. We don't use it very much in English. It's really not an English word. Uh, it means the awakefulness of the soul. And it's, it's a refutation of the doctrine of soul sleep. That between the, the death of the body and the resurrection, the soul uh, enters into a period of somnolence, of sleep or quiescence and rest. The more extreme view of that teaching is that the soul actually dies. It's called mortalism. That the soul uh, goes out of existence, only to be resurrected again at the end of the age. Well, uh, Calvin takes upon himself, I'm going to say a little bit about who he was writing against and what prompted him to do this. He takes it upon himself to, to give a refutation of this teaching. It seems a little out of character. I mean, why this topic of all the things he could, could have written about? Uh, and yet, I think it's an important uh, document for understanding Calvin's development of thought and for identifying what we might call the eschatological tension in his thinking um, related to uh, the life of the believer between death and the resurrection. The first printed copy we have of this little book is from 1542. Now, if you know your Calvin biography real well, you'll know that he's already been through the first sojourn in Geneva. He's been expelled. He's been to Strasbourg uh, for three years. That was the happiest period of his life, I'm sure. Uh, he was pastor of a little French-speaking church. He married his wife, Idolette de Boer. Uh, he was a teacher in the Academy of Strasbourg. He attended a number of a colloquia, kind of international ecumenical gatherings uh, with Bootser and others. It was a good time in Calvin's life, a time of productivity. That's when he wrote uh, his first commentary uh, on uh, uh, Galatians, uh, Romans, not 1539, his Romans commentary. That's when he wrote his famous letter to Cardinal Sadele, giving a brilliant defense of the Reformed Protestant position. So this is after all of that. So at 1542, a good bit of water is under the dam in Calvin's life. A lot of formation has taken place. He's published uh, the first and now second edition of the Institutes, 1541. He's working on the third, 1543. It's right at this time that he brings out, published at Strasbourg, this book on Sucopanikia, re refuting the doctrine of soul sleep. Now, um, who is he writing against? Who is he so upset by? Against whom was the Sucopanikia directed? Well, it's a difficult question to reconstruct that because Calvin attributes them to the dregs of the Anabaptists. The dregs of the Anabaptists. However, um, we're not sure that he knew very many Anabaptists at that point. <laughs> He never names them, and most people think that this is just kind of a general smear term, that Calvin is, anybody who teaches this doctrine must be one of the Anabaptists. And remember what I said this morning about Munster and the bad reputation Anabaptism in general had. Is Calvin just using this as a grab bag term, blaming this teaching on the Anabaptists? Well, uh, a number of possible opponents have been proposed. I want to mention two or three and then look at the treatise again a little closer. We know that there was a lot of speculation about the soul and death and life after death and between death and the resurrection. There was a lot of speculation about this. In <clears throat> late medieval scholasticism and classical thinking, particularly coming from and a veroistic interpretation of Aristotle. Now, you know Aristotle, don't you? Um, because it seems to me, this isn't in my lecture, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, it, it seems to me that everybody, just about everybody, either leans toward being an Aristotelian or leans toward being a Platonist. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but uh, it seems to me that you just sort of have a leaning one way or the other. You don't want to go too far. 
if you go too far, you'll, you'll jump off the, the road and you'll be in the ditch. And you can go too far in either direction. I think Calvin leaned toward being a Platonist, but didn't want to go too far in that direction. The Averroist, on the other hand, these people who were shaped by late medieval scholastic theology, were leaning toward an Aristotelian anthropology. The key figure here was a man named Pietro Papanazzi, and he gave a daring analysis of Aristotle's anthropology. And at the same time, he wanted to demonstrate by reason the mortality of the soul. And he thinks that this can be deduced by human reason. It doesn't have to be a threat to ecclesiastical church teaching. So this mortalism is going around in late medieval schools and is picked up by some of the people my great teacher George Williams termed evangelical rationalists in the Radical Reformation. He says the Radical Reformation is divided into three major groupings. There are the spiritualists, there are the evangelical Anabaptists, and then there are these rationalists, these evangelical rationalists who look to the soul as being uh, defined by its reason. Uh, Servetus, perhaps, was one of these. Camillo Renato was another one. Uh, they were around, and they seem to have taught a doctrine very similar uh, to psychopanicism, that between death and the resurrection, the soul is asleep or even that the soul dies. Well, uh, that's one possibility. The Italian Averroist, the rationalist, the evangelical rationalist. But what about the evangelical Anabaptists? Uh, was soul sleep one of their teachings? Mennonites today who study, they regard the, these Anabaptists as their forebears in the faith, so they want to know this, uh, deny that that is true. And it is hard to find in some of the, the great thinkers like Minnow Simons or Michael Sattler or Pilgrim Marpeck, it's hard to find uh, psychopanicism taught in their teaching. A few places, though, it does uh, surface, like, for example, in the, the work of Karlstadt, uh, Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt, Luther's colleague, at Wittenberg, who becomes increasingly more and more of a radical. And a man named Klaus Westerberg is another one. So maybe some of these evangelical Anabaptists were also uh, at least flirting with, if not openly embracing, the idea of uh, psychopanicism. Third possibility, Lutheran soul sleepers. Now, when Calvin first published this doctrine, he, uh, this book in 15... 34, he, he published it from Orléans. So this is before Basel, this is before Strasbourg, very early in Calvin's life as a, as a Protestant, for sure. And he sends a copy, a handwritten copy, to Wolfgang Capito, reformer with Bootser of Strasbourg. And Capito reads it. First of all, he says, I can hardly read your handwriting, Calvin. Uh, his writing was very tiny. And it is. If you've looked at any Calvin manuscripts, very tiny scrawl. I can hardly read that. And then besides, once I could read it and understand it, we shouldn't publish it because it's liable to offend some bony very, some good men who have fallen into this error, either from excessive credulity or from ignorance of the Scriptures. He doesn't name who these people are, but... Who could they be? Who could they be? These splendid authors, these bony very, who uh, he doesn't want Calvin to offend by publishing his treatise against soul sleep. Well, uh, chances are, most likely, they were actually Lutherans, maybe even Luther himself. That has been suggested by more than one people. Luther flirted with the idea of soul sleep. Uh, Paul Althaus, one of the great Luther scholars of the 20th century, has a chapter in which he says Luther did teach soul sleep. And you have to sort of look where he, this comes out. One of the places it comes out is when Luther is describing the uh, second coming of, of Christ, the, last, the second advent. And he says when Jesus comes back again, he's going to step out on a cloud and he's going to shout loud enough to wake up the dead. He's going to say, 
Dr. Martinus, come forth. Well, it's interesting. Luther thinks Jesus will call him by name. Dr. Martinus. And call him doctor. He wants, he, he wants that registered at the final resurrection. So uh, Luther uh, could have taught this doctrine of soul sleep, at least uh, flirted with it enough to arouse the opposition of a young buck ready to go for the race like John Calvin and delivered his ire against him. Calvin never names Luther, and he never names the Lutherans. But later on, when he does come to publish this document in 1542, uh, it could be that he's looking over his shoulder at some of the Lutheran reformers who partly uh, uh, would advance a doctrine like soul sleep. Why would it be attractive to them? Why, why, what is there in the air that would cause them to be uh, open to soul sleep? Well, if you believe in soul sleep, you know what you, else you cannot believe in? Yeah, purgatory. There's no reason to have purgatory if the soul is asleep. And so it seems to be a way of shutting down one of the late medieval Catholic doctrines that the Protestants eventually come to say is unbiblical and therefore not a part of the, of the doctrine of the faith. Well, um, let's look positively now for about 10 or 15 minutes at this treatise. What is he actually saying theologically? Immortality of the soul. This little treatise contains Calvin's first extensive treatment of the nature and origin of the human soul. Now, he'll pick this up again, of course, when he goes to the Institutes, the first edition of which happens in 1536. It'll be greatly expanded in subsequent editions. So it becomes a pretty major section of the final edition of the Institutes from 1559. Uh, Calvin wants to claim to follow a strictly biblical view of the soul and to reject the view that there is any kind of natural immortality of the soul, such as was put forth, for example, at the Fifth Lateran Council in 1513. This was an ecumenical general council held on the eve of the Reformation in which the doctrine by Leo X, the same pope who condemns Luther a little later, comes out and condemns the idea of soul sleep and advances the idea of the natural immortality of the soul. Well, um, Calvin does not want to accept the natural immortality of the soul. And he wants to claim that immortality is a gift from God. It's, it's, it's a part of being created in the image of God. And it's not anything that we can kind of depend on as a part of the human constitution, just naturally speaking. And he cites, in fact, uh, a number of different people from the early church, like Gregory, Irenaeus, Origen, Cyprian, Jerome, Augustine, uh, to back up this view that there is no natural immortality of the soul. That's a Greek idea. It's, it's a, a pagan idea, if you want to put it that way. It's not found to be in the scriptures, and therefore we should not teach it or believe it. And to look at the scriptures more closely, he, he picks up that passage from Revelation 6, where the souls are said to have cried out under the altar, to have received white robes. And with a touch of sarcasm, Calvin asks, O oh, sleeping spirits! What are white robes to you? Are they pillows on which you are to lie down and sleep? You see that white robes are not at all adapted for sleep. And therefore, when thus clothed, they must be awake. Sukupanakia, awake, not asleep. And also, this is interesting uh, from the standpoint of the, the biblical canon in the Reformation, Calvin here quotes from a number of non-canonical, apocryphal writings like the Book of Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, the Book, book of Esdras, uh, and, and without making any distinction from them and the Scriptures. This was at a time when the question of the canon was still somewhat in flux. The Council of Trent had not yet met to decide the Catholic canon with definition. So that, the immortality of the soul is a big issue, and he's trying to base it on Scripture and not on philosophy and reason. Second, and I think this is a more important point, Calvin wants to focus on the Christological basis of the believer's union 
with Jesus Christ. In 1536, in the Institutes, he declares, The whole sum of our salvation and also all of its parts are comprehended in Christ. And by faith we possess Christ and all that is His. And so it shouldn't be surprising that in the Sucopanikia, Calvin appeals to the Christological focus of redemption to buttress his argument against soul sleep. There is an inviolate nexus between Christ and the believer. When Paul proclaims that we have been made conformable to Christ's death, Calvin draws a precise parallel. This is Calvin's words. Now, O dreamy sleepers, commune with your hearts and consider how Christ died. Did he sleep when he was working for your salvation? Let any one of you now put on a supercilious air and pretend that the death of Christ was asleep. Or let him go over and join the camp of Apollinaris. You know, he was the heretic who denied that Christ had a human soul. Christ was indeed awake when he exerted himself for your salvation. But you sleep your sleep and are buried in the darkness of blindness, giving no heed to his awakening calls. What he's arguing is Jesus Christ in his work of redemption for us did not accomplish that while asleep. And we who have been engrafted into him, begins to use that language that will become prominent in the institutes, who have been engrafted into Christ, united with Christ by the Holy Spirit, We, too, are kept by him in a condition of wakefulness between death and the resurrection. Soteriological concerns, too, come in here. The believer's union with Christ is not abrogated, but rather enhanced by the death of the body. If at death the believer was to lapse into some unconscious slumber, their constant communion with Christ would be severed. This would mean, in effect, that we would not enjoy the greater bliss, that we would, would mean that we would now enjoy greater bliss than we will hereafter. If, as they maintain, our souls are at death overwhelmed with lethargy and are buried in oblivion, then they must lose every kind of spiritual enjoyment which they previously possessed. So instead of what Paul says in Philippians to to die, rejoice that you die and go to be with Christ, which is far better, you know, it's much better than being here. That wouldn't be true if what the Sucopanikias teach about soul sleep uh, was the case. Well, uh, this, this little treatise stirred up some hornets in the 16th century and, and got the attention of a number of different people. Um, For Calvin, it was a way of what I was saying this morning about the sursum corda. Lift up your hearts. Lift up your hearts. It's it's the fact that in this world, uh, we live in a time of warfare. We are stung by sin and the remains of the flesh. And we look forward and we meditate on the future life, which is a blessed life because Christ is alive and Christ is awake. He's not asleep, and neither will we be asleep. One major objection which Calvin's opponents had leveled against traditional eschatology was that it reduced the resurrection to an anticlimactic event at the end of the age. How will the elect be then called to the possession of the heavenly kingdom if they already possess it? How can they be told to come if they're already there? How will people then be saved if they're safe already? To forestall that kind of objection, Calvin emphasizes the incompleteness of the beatific vision before the resurrection. So in that intermediate state, as we call it, between death and the resurrection, there's a being with Christ, there's a united with Christ that cannot be uh, separated by any condition of somnolence or sleep or death. But at the same time, we're not there yet completely. There's more to come. And the souls under the altar in the book of Revelation are also longing and praying, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the meantime, in our day and time, 
Calvin says, we're not there yet. We are still a pilgrim church on the earth. That's one of his favorite expressions for the church. It's a pilgrim church. It's a church on the road, a church in progress, a church moving forward, not yet caught in the tension, defining its mission between the no longer and the not yet. And I think it's at this point when the church is the pilgrim church, sighing and longing, lifting up your heart to the heavenly kingdom. At this point that you, you see individual eschatology and corporate eschatology, the individual believer and the life of the elect people of God come together. They converge. For Calvin, the way one viewed life after death had important implications for the way one lived life before death. I want to say that again. I don't, I don't want you to miss this statement because I think it's, it's key to Calvin. The way one viewed life after death had important implications for the way one lived life before death. The regnum Christi, the kingdom of Christ, consists both in the progress of believers and the building up of the church. The church is a community of pilgrims, itself is a pilgrim community, and is often enough the church under the cross. Ecclesia militans, the militant church, the church at war with the principalities and powers of the present age. This is the church which is sustained amidst all the struggles by the assurance of its union with Christ, which not even death can sever, and by its expectation of the ultimate victory of that kingdom which hath not hands. Such are the people, Calvin says, who sing and celebrate the goodness of the Lord, for he delivers and restores the hopes of those who are afflicted and bruised and in despair. Perhaps these were among Calvin's thoughts as he was on the road fleeing persecution in his native France, as he trudged along the road toward Basel with Louis de Toulay's stinging accusation in his mind, as he continued on the road, as he came back to Geneva to begin uh, his long period of ministry and production there in 1541. And now just a brief postscript, and then we'll open this up for general questions and discussions. In the winter of 1534-1535, I'm sorry, I'm back in the 16th century. Let me come into the 20th. My wife always accuses me of living in the 16th century. <laughs> and now I've proved her right. <laughs> in the winter term at school of 1934-1935, Bart's theological students at Bonn, Karl Bart's was still in Germany, teaching a seminar, and you know what he was using for his text? Psychopanikia. It had just come out in a brand new edition, critical edition and translation into German by Walter Zimmerli. Some of you may know that name. He was an Old Testament scholar. We still come across his name in footnotes, Zimmerli. He brought out an edition of Calvin's Psychopanikia. And that was the text that Bart had chosen for their seminar. And he followed the method of explicatio de text. You read the text, you comment on it, you see what, what Calvin was trying to say. However, in 1934-35, that winter term, they were never able to complete the study of the Sucopanachia, even though they had a brand new critical edition of it by Zimmerle in their hands. Why? Well, it was precisely at that time that Bart received a deportation order from the Reich government in Berlin to leave Germany. He was deported from Germany back to Switzerland because he refused to give the Hitler salute in his seminar. Never able to complete this study. He found refuge in Basel, as Calvin had done much, much earlier. Well, we live in that same kind of time today. Not the same issues, maybe, 
But we live in the time when uncertainty is in the air, when we cannot count on finishing anything we begin in the academic world. Because in our own apocalyptic times, Calvin's eschatology still needs to be studied, both its personal and corporate dimensions, by a church which, in the midst of turbulence, dares still to hope and to wait with expectation on that time when the shadows shall fall away and we'll be reunited with Christ in glory and all those who have gone before us.